Hi, I'm Carolyn Greer. I am a, a co-founder and the co-producer of the Brooklyn Book Festival. Thank you for joining us for this program and for being at the festival. This uh, debut program is one of my personal favorites, Who Knew 2020? Every season, the festival chooses uh, a select number of debut authors that we say you really shouldn't miss their books. Um, we chose six this year out of dozens and dozens that we read. The six include The New Wilderness by Diane Cook, Like a Bird by Faria Roisin, My Mother's House by Francesca Montplaisir, What's Left of Me is Yours, Stephanie Scott, White Out by Tariq Shaw, and Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kavai Strong Washburn. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to each of these talented debut authors. And I wanna say that the festival's credo is support authors and buy their books, please. Um, and we're gonna start by hearing a reading from Faria Roy Sheen, a poet whose debut book, Like a Bird, is a compelling tale of a young woman's resilience after a life assaulting trauma. She's uh, assisted by the ghost of her Indian grandmother, Faria. Hello, my name is Fariha Roshin. I am a writer based in Brooklyn, coming to you from my home, my very humble home in Crown Heights. Um, apologies for any of the sounds outside. There's a little bit of traffic, but there's also um, young boys playing basketball. It's still late summer and I love it. I love hearing the sound of basketball um, and kids laughing. It's really nice. I am also the author of Like a Bird, uh, my first novel. I've been writing it for 18 years, um, and it's a story that came to me in a dream when I was 12 years old, and I've been writing it since then. So it's been a beautiful and cathartic experience, but also extremely terrifying to put it out there and be vulnerable and sit with all the feelings that come with um, the fear of not being misunderstood, the fear of people glossing over parts that are so meaningful and vital to your well-being. This story is, is something that saved me and was definitely something that I think I committed to as a healing journey even before I knew what I was doing. Um, I didn't have that kind of language when I was 12, but it's kind of incredible that we find ways to survive. Um, so it's a very personal story, uh, and it centers around this character called Talia, and um, she's biracial, she's half Indian, uh, her father is from Calcutta, and her mother is American and Jewish, and she's sort of raised in this crucible of longing and sadness and self-hatred and those are the things that she sort of carries with her as um, an ancestral pain almost um, and then something brutal happens to her and she's disowned and the entire story is sort of her um, not only embracing the things that happened to her but learning how to move forward so I'm gonna read you something from Like a Bird right now. That night at Cats, I took a hot shower and I tried to look at myself in the foggy mirror. I wanted to become my own witness. I had visions of Dalima as I washed and grasped at my old talisman, my chain with two rings on it that I always wore around my neck. I thought back to when she had gotten very ill. She lived in Kolkata, and Baba, full with filial piety, insisted that we move to give her moral support in her last days. So we relocated to India for a few months during the summer holidays in my early teens, leaving our Upper West Side brownstone for a home in bustling West Bengal. It's strange how death was such a sly interloper of feelings. At the announcement of impending mortality, Baba's sense of duty was suddenly forced into motion with a fortitude of longing and soured regrets. Regrets of not being physically closer, regrets 
of leaving his mother and father, perhaps also the misgivings of marrying a white woman and not being able to bear sons, nothing to continue our name or his and his parents' culture. I was soon enchanted by India. Growing up in New York often provides you with the conceit that no other city is worth venturing to. The busy streets of India were, unlike New York, filled with an unnameable exuberance and a strong, dreamy energy. The rickshaws, the cars, even the raucous fumes felt like home. I grew fond of seeing lakes, cement and sloping green trees, the secret Mughal gardens, with a readied excitement. Outpacing the chase, what resided in the streets of Kolkata was also a kindred resilience. The people were friendly and cared for you, and that was the strangest part of it all. Dadima, someone I had never met before in my life, cared about me. Her love was so thick I could feel it, slick and stretched out, floating past me, even when I was away from her. The first night I was there, she sat me down and combed my hair, lovingly caressing my temples to my roots, slathering my hair with coconut oil. The light through the Venetian blinds traced our bodies as I sat at her feet, my torso enveloped in her shada sari. She smelt of burnt cinnamon and her hands were soft and rubbery, like a toy, comforting as she drew me to her. Gold bands lined her delicate wrists, hanging off her body's ancient tapestry, clicking and clinking every time she moved. Every night after that, she'd kiss me goodnight and call me her putul. She never fretted over the fact that I wasn't like Alyssa. She loved me unconditionally for who I was. I meant something to her, and that meant everything to me. Within the cracks of my childhood, my relationship with my dadima was a tangible kitsugi to my healing. Like gold glue, the veins of a leaf, she filled me with an intense, overwhelming serenity, but more, she initiated a healing of sorts. There was something powerful in being seen by her, the theme of my life. The need for my body to be seen in all its varying dimensions was like a drug I was hooked on. It gave me permission to like myself too. A diminutive me, Dadima, and e Dadima and I even had the same thick, fuzzy brows, the same button nose, the same petal-shaped lips. She spoke mainly in Bangla, not because she couldn't speak English, but because she didn't want to, and would argue with Baba for not teaching me and Alyssa the language. You must read Rokia Sakawat Hossein Tebia. That was one of the few things she ever said to me in English, both a suggestion and a command. I also liked the way she clearly loved me more than Alyssa, possibly the only person where that was the case. I had never needed to prove my worthiness of love to my dadima as a faulty Alyssa, a less exceptional, diluted version of her. To dadima, I was me in all my clumsy glory. And in days where we napped, lined my milky mosquito nets, I remembered that I was loved. She passed away five weeks into our visit. Although I knew it would happen, I never believed it really could. Here was a strong woman, never submitting to the demands society put on her sex. She went to school when women weren't allowed to. She raised a son and sent him to America despite growing up relatively middle class. She was strong-willed in every sense of the word and had a great understanding of herself and what she wanted to contribute to the world. Thank you. Now we have Tariq Shaw reading from his very cool and sometimes comic novel about friendships, family, and an unforgettable trip to a funeral, Whiteout Conditions. Hi everybody, my name is Tarek Shaw. I'm a writer based in Bushwick, Brooklyn, um, and I'm from Illinois originally. Um, and I'm gonna read to you from my book, um, Whiteout Conditions, put out by $2 Radio. Um, there's not too much you need to know um, about the selections. Um, so 
I'm just going to dive in. The sun is on the rise. I haven't really slept. Doubt Vince has either. On the little balcony, out over the rooftops, I watch chimney smoke flutter. Ragged little white flags nodded to the pipes and stacks rising into the sky. Gray pre-dawn winds drive a slab of clouds off. I used to hate funerals. They were so sad. So suffocating, really. A Klieg light under which I had nothing to perform, no material. I would wander that agonizing stage, sweating buckets, dodging gazes seeking mine. So many hugs, I still hate them, even now. Mom, hollow cheeked, a fixed up mannequin, wig and all. The crowd surveilling me, waiting for me to do what? I wanted to scream at them, don't you get it? I was the one who clapped. The starlet is there, in that pine box, is no more. Show's over. I have all sorts of responses to the questions I ask myself as to why I go. They all nick the bullseye. Specific, isolated reasons all cluster and gang up on me into this kind of preternatural, instinctual pull. Off I go, like a picnic basket carried away by a black river of ants, not caring why. Ambling through the wake, a kind of graduate, an old retired pro. Idling in the parlor, mute, holographic, negative space, loitering in the nave, burning the clock. But there is something honest involved in each of my answers, to a varying degree, about the end, and the end. Grandpa in the casket, hands folded at the waist, wearing what looked like grandma's lipstick. Grandma smelling like talcum powder. When I think about the truth involved in that answer, the answer to the big question of what's left after rendering down all these answers, I feel too close to a cliff within myself. Everyone I thought invincible, shattered, shell-shocked, asking each other what to do. All of them absolutely, in all honesty, clueless. We were all at a loss. I love that funeral parlors are like fake living rooms, how they appear to be equal parts resort hotel lobby and sitcom set for the bereaved. The knockoff Turners and Titians proudly hung in the foyer, the bowl of starlight mints, the chandelier around which the staircase dovetails, the ashtrays all at the ready, inside every desk and coffee table drawer. The raw wood aroma you got opening up the cabinets of sawdust. The unvacuumed carpeting strangers trample with their dress shoes on. The film of spilt coffee burning on the gummy hot plate. I love that it could almost be someone's home. Nondescript save the marquee in the drive. The brass plaque beside the doorbell. They try so hard, and yet the further one pokes around, the more abnormal it becomes. The bare cupboards, hollow clocks, empty closets, the absence of cohesion the family brings to a household with their framed photos, dog-eared Sports Illustrated issues, their toothbrush cups by the sink, and the general disorder of socks, muddy sneakers, dishes, junk mail that enlivens the places we inhabit. That there are no watercolor pa paintings, softball schedules, shopping lists, bright silly magnets. Nothing is ever stuck to the door of the fridge. The whole show, the bouquets and blackout drapes, the living room chapels, the organs droning out dirges to drum machine beats, the discount casket coupons thumbtacked by the phone, padlock basement door. None of it 
is morbid to me anymore. I love the hearse, the motorcade following behind it, and the little paper tickets you put in the windshield, and running red lights, headlights on in the daytime, the little plastic hooks by which the living hang potted flowers beside the graves like lanterns. I love the giant register everyone must sign. I love the bad lemon tea on offer, the stale cookies in their plastic tray, how there's never milk, only powdered sugar-free creamer. I love that it's all a terrible party thrown midday, midweek, at a house with never enough parking, nothing at all to do, that no one can stand to be in for more than an hour. Except me. Thank you. I want to thank the Brooklyn Book Festival and Two Dollar Radio for letting me read. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank all my fellow um, authors and readers um, as well. Thanks again. Next, we have Diane Cook reading from her brutal but beautiful novel, The New Wilderness. And Diane, big congrats for being shortlisted for the 2020 Booker. Hi, my name is Diane Cook, and I'm the author of The New Wilderness. It's a novel that came out in August. Um, I am also, it's my first novel, but I also wrote a book of short stories called Man v. Nature that came out a few years ago. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York, usually, although currently I'm in quarantine with my mother-in-law <laughs> in Michigan. Uh, we, my husband and I just had our second baby in June, and we're here to get out of Brooklyn and have a yard <laughs> for our older daughter to play in and get some help around the house with the new baby um, in these crazy pandemic times. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about The New Wilderness. Um, it is a book that looks at the future, a speculative novel that imagines a world or a country, the U.S., when there's only one wilderness area left um, and the rest of the land is used for resources, is developed, is part of the great huge city where everybody lives. Um, the city's pretty polluted. Um, a lot of, some people are looking to get out. And the f novel follows a group of people who sign up for an experiment to go live in the last place that's untouched. It's called the Wilderness State, and it's the last wilderness area. And my novel follows a group of these 20 um, people who've decided to join the experiment. The main characters are B and Agnes, her daughter. They've come to the Wilderness State to escape the pollution of the city. Agnes is very sick, and she needs new air, clean air, to survive. The book is about mothers and daughters, climate change, land use, the environment, civilization, wilderness and wildness, community. Um, it's a big nature book. <laughs> and I hope you check it out. I'm gonna read a little bit from the beginning of it. The baby emerged from B the color of a bruise. B burned the cord somewhere between them and uncoiled it from the girl's slight neck. And though she knew it was useless, swept her daughter up into her hands, tapped on her soft chest, and blew a few shallow breaths into her slimy mouth. Around her, the singular song of crickets expanded. Bee's skin prickled from heat. Sweat dried on her back and face. The sun had crested and would more quickly than seemed right fall again. From where Bee knelt, she saw their valley, its secret grasses and sage. In the distance were lonely buttes and closer mud mounds that looked like cairns marking the way somewhere. The caldera stood sharp and white on the horizon. Bee dug into the hard earth with a stick, then a stone, then hollowed and smoothed it with her hands. She scooped the placenta into it and then the girl. The hole was shallow and her baby's belly jutted from it. 
Wet from birth, the little body held on to the coarse sand and tiny golden buds, bristled from their stems by the heat of the sun. She sprinkled more dust onto the baby's forehead, pulled from her deer hide bag several wilted green leaves and laid them over the girl. She broke off craggy branches from the surrounding sage, laid them over the distended belly, the absurdly small shoulders. The baby was a misshapen mound of plant green, rust red blood, a dull violet map of veins under wet tissue skin. Now the animals who had sensed it were converging. In the sky, a cyclone of buzzards lowered as if to check on the progress, then uplifted on a thermal. She heard the soft tread of coyotes. They wove through the bloomy sage. A mother and three skinny kits appeared under jaggedly thrown shade. Bee heard whines ease from their impassive yawns. They would wait. A wind stirred and she breathed in the dusty heat. She missed the stagnant scent of the hospital room where she'd given birth to Agnes what must have been eight years ago now. The way the scratchy gown had stretched across her chest and gotten tangled up when she tried to roll to either side. How the cool air blew around her hips between her legs where her doctors and nurses stared, prodded, and pulled Agnes from her. She'd hated the feeling, so exposed, used, animal-like. But here it was all dust and hot air. Here she had needed to guide the small body herself. Had the baby been five, six months, seven months? Out with one hand, while with the other she'd had to block a diving magpie. She'd wanted to be alone for this, but what she wouldn't have given for some probing gloved hand, stale recirculated air, humming machines, fresh sheets under her rather than desert dust, some sterile comfort, what she wouldn't have given for her mother. Bee hissed at the coyotes. Scram, she said, pitching the dirt and pebbles she'd just dug at them. But they only slid their ears back, the mother sinking to her haunches and the kits nipping at her snout, irritating her. She probably snuck off from the rest of the pack to get something extra for her young, or to let them pra practice scavenging to practice surviving. It's what mothers did. Bee shoot a fly from near her baby's eyes, what which at first had looked startled over having not made it, but now seemed accusatory. The truth was Bee hadn't wanted the baby, not here. It would have been wrong to bring her into this world. That's what she'd felt all along. But what if the, ba the girl had sensed Bee's dread and died from not being wanted? Bee choked. This is for the best, she told the girl. Thank you. The next debut pick is my mother's house, and I don't think it's a spoiler alert to say that the house is a character in this haunting story. Uh, Francesca Montplaisir. Greetings, and thank you to the Brooklyn Book Festival for having me. My name is Francesca Montplaisir, and I am the author of My Mother's House, which is my debut novel. I am a literature scholar and writer of poetry, my first love, in uh, both Haitian Creole and in English, and I'm also a fiction writer. This is my debut novel, my first novel published, but not the first written. My Mother's House uh, is a novel that has a th three protagonists, including the house itself called Lakai. It is a sentient, living, breathing, thinking house with tremendous agency. Lakai is inhabited by its nemesis, Lucien Louverture, who is a Haitian immigrant who preys on women and has been doing so for decades, both in Haiti, but also in Southwold on Park, Queens, New York, which is where the novel is set. When the house decided that it has had enough of Lucien's lasciviousness, it decides to commit murder-suicide by setting itself on fire with him inside. But what the house doesn't realize is that it has other inhabitants. 
The section I'm about to read is uh, representative of the House's narration of the history of South Ozone Park of New York, of uh, the United States, and specifically the history of racist brutality and the murder of black men at, at the hands of police. So now I will read the House's section, one of the House's sections um, in my mother's house. Lakai. What had been an ordinary morning of keeping its eyes and ears peeled for tidbits of news had turned into a day of rage and outrage, of tears from men who'd held them back at their mother's funerals. Lakai leaned in as if to comfortingly embrace com patrons who, who were bawling over the near death of one of their own. Haitian cab driver Abner Louima had been beaten and sodomized in a Brooklyn police precinct not 10 miles from South Ozone Park. It had wept over the shoulders of its occupants and visitors over the bloody beating that had made the front page of New York's major newspapers. Since they hadn't been able to stop talking about what had befallen their fellow countrymen, it had learned more than it had wanted about the broom handle rape and bathroom battery by cops. It had watched closely for Mariange's reaction. She hadn't cried a single tear. She hadn't even choked up at the newsreels of a swollen and disfigured Louima in the hospital, at least not in the presence of anyone at Cam. Lakai had followed her closely as she'd struggled down the basement stairs into Ezili's new peristyle in the boiler room. She cried then to her goddess and prayed for justice if outright revenge could not be delivered. Like every good mumble and every worthwhile unga in New York at that time, she lit candles and poured clairin over the altar and then rubbed the rest on her face to help right the horrible wrong. Lakai had kept quiet while dancing with Marie-Ange during truncated but potent ceremonies in a space barely bigger than a bathroom stall. It had been in lockstep with every movement, including her final gesture of spitting a last swig of clairin at the basement door behind which Lucien had been hosting his, his tenant, Asante. Less than two years later, it had mourned two deaths with the people at Cam. Marie-Ange had succumbed to cancer one week before Amadou Diallo's murder. It had been surprised that her death had not been memorialized by even an obituary in a single newspaper. It figured that she had been less important since she hadn't died at the hands of the NYPD. But like the people at Cam, it had wept equally over her departure as over those who'd suffered at the hands of evil empowered authorities. It had learned that police beatings were nothing new to the people at Cam. Some had fled the same at the hands of Jean-Claude Duvalier's Tonton Marcout before immigrating. At least in America, there had been a semblance of justice painted in the media. Even if it wasn't real, the gesture had meant a lot to those who could never have hoped for the same in their native country. Lying prostrate after the crippling fire, Lacai remembered the record Lucien used to play about Marcout abuse. He blasted it for the entire neighborhood to hear but no one had been able to play it in Haiti without fear of a sound thrashing while Baby Doc occupied the Palais National. Lakai had heard no songs for Marie-Ange or Louima, but later Diallo would get a well-deserved but ironic 21-gun salute in one of Wyclef's songs. When Kam had learned that Diallo had been murdered by police in the vestibule of the Bronx tenement where he lived, Every taxi driver in South Ozone Park had wanted to pack up and move back to Haiti. If that had happened, half the houses in the neighborhood would have been left vacant. Under the pretext of preventing a recurrence of the Louima and Diallo incidents, Lacai had pulled together a huddle of its associates owned by taxi drivers to learn exactly what had happened in the Bronx. However, its real purpose had, had been to learn if that might be a way to get rid of Lucien without having to kill itself in the process. It had marveled at the randomness of the Louima and Diallo incidents. 
It had read about and watched national news broadcasts about another cab driver, Rodney King, who had been beaten on the side of an LA road by a bunch of cops. 16-year-old Yusuf Hawkins had been shot to death in Bensonhurst. Trinidadian Michael Griffith had been murdered just up the road in Howard Beach. Willie Turks had been stomped to death in Gravesend. The house had wearied of going back through the previous decades up to its birth. It couldn't have even imagined what had happened in the centuries before then. Lakai had gathered its closest associates to find out not only why these murders had been perpetrated, but why these men? It couldn't have known if they'd done anything besides being poor, black, or immigrant. It had deduced, based on the newspaper articles and the television, that these had been good, innocent men. So why them? Why not the hundreds of murderers on Rikers Island? No, not the innocent ones serving sentences for petty offenses or crimes they hadn't committed at all not the ones framed by corrupt detectives or a racist district attorney. It had been thinking of the ones who had taken lives, committed rapes. No, not the wrongly accused teenagers who'd been tricked into making false confessions. The real criminals, the ones who'd been caught red-handed and about whose guilt there had been no doubt. Those ones, why not them? Why not a man like Lucien? Lucien, who'd been preying on women since Ba Kaimit. How could it get to him? Set him up to be shot 21 times on the side of a highway without a day in court? How could it find the right mob or an easily bribed group of cops who needed no probable cause to go after a black man, to take him out for all of his evil? Lakai, Lakai wanted to know, it wanted to plan, it wanted to execute but it didn't even know and hadn't even learned about the worst. We're now joined by Stephanie Scott, whose debut book, What's Left of Me is Yours, is fascinating and original, a love story from the intersection of how possession and protection connect. Stephanie? Hi, I'm Stephanie Scott, and this is my debut novel, What's Left of Me is Yours. I have wanted to be a novelist all my life, and so it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here with you today. I'm half Singaporean, half British, and I was born and raised in Singapore, and my family is still based there. I'm currently in London, and my novel is set in Japan. What's Left of Me is Yours has been 10 years in the making and the story is actually inspired by a true crime, a murder, which occurred within the Japanese marriage breakup industry. In Japan, with contested divorces, an at-fault system applies, and these actually exist all around the world today. But what this means is that in Japan, if you want a divorce, but you don't think your partner will give you one, you can hire someone to seduce them and provide you with grounds for divorce and also an upper hand in the proceedings. And this is what happened in the real case. Um, the target in that case was also later murdered. And when the police arrested the marriage breakup agent who'd been hired to seduce her, he said that he loved her and he couldn't live without her and that he loved her still. And this sparked off so many questions for me because I wondered if that could possibly be true, if you could love someone and kill them because love in its ideal form is selfless. And then I started thinking about Tolstoy and how perhaps there are as many different kinds of love as there are people. So how we love and what we're capable of doing to each other for love is really where the novel began. What's Left of Me is Yours is also a story of mothers and daughters. And the narrative begins with Simiko, a young woman, a lawyer living in Tokyo, who has grown up never truly knowing how her mother died until one day that changes. And it's through Simiko that we access the past narrative, the hiring of the marriage breakup agent, the love story, and all of the events that ensued from that point. And this is how the truth comes to light. I'll read to you now from the prologue. Sarashima is a beautiful name, a lone name now that it belongs only to me. I was not born with it, this name, but I have chosen to take it 
because once it belonged to my mother. It is customary upon meeting someone to explain who you are and where you come from, but whether you realise it or not, you already know me and you know my story. Look closely, reach into the far corners of your mind and sift through the news clippings, bulletins, tabloid crimes tucked away there. You will see me. I am the line at the end of an article. I am the final sentence, ending with a full stop. Wakare Sasea Agent Goes Too Far by Yu Yamada, published on the 16th of May, 1994, at 6.30pm. The trial of Kaitaro Nakamura, the man accused of murdering Rina Sato, began today at the Tokyo District Court. The case has attracted international attention due to the fact that the defendant, Nakamura, is an agent in the Wakare Sasea, or so-called marriage breakup industry, and has admitted that he was hired by the victim's husband to seduce his wife and provide grounds for divorce. Nakamura claims that he and the deceased fell in love and were planning to start a new life together. If convicted of murder, Nakamura faces a minimum 20-year prison sentence. The judges may even consider the death penalty. Rina Sato's father, Yoshitaki Sarashima, told reporters, A business such as this, which destroys people's lives, should not be allowed to operate in Tokyo. Rina was my only child and the heart of our family. I shall never get over her loss, nor forgive it. Rina Sato is survived by a daughter of seven years old. Can you remember when you first read this? Were you at home, at your breakfast table, or in the office scanning the morning news? I can see your face as you read about my family. Your brows drew together in a slight frown, a crinkle formed above your nose. Perhaps the smell of coffee was strong and reassuring in the air, for eventually you shook your head and turned the page. The world is full of strange things. Wakare Sasea was not common in Japan when Kaitaro was drawn into my mother's life. The industry emerged out of a demand for its services, a demand that exists all over the world today. Look at the people around you, those you love, those who love you, those who want what you have. They can enter your life as easily as he entered mine. Do you know now when we first met or where? Was it in the Telegraph, the New York Times, Le Monde, the Sydney Morning Herald? My story stopped there in the foreign press. Later articles focused on the marriage breakup industry itself and the agents who populated, but none of them mentioned me. Lives to be rebuilt are always less interesting than lives destroyed. Even in Japan, I disappeared from the page. Thank you. Finally, Kavai Strong Washburn reads from his debut, Sharks in the Time of Saviors, a tale of a Hawaiian family, ancient Hawaiian gods, and turmoil, an emotional tour de force. Hi, my name is Kavai Strong Washburn, and I recently wrote a debut novel, Sharks in the Time of Saviors. This is a novel that spans 20 years in the lives of a family from Hawaii that is witness to a miracle when their youngest son is saved from drowning by sharks. The family takes this miracle as a sign from ancient Hawaiian gods that they're going to be blessed and protected. And the story launches off from there as the family witnesses several other sort of supernatural or, or otherworldly events. These things are happening at the same time as the family struggling to understand itself and its identity under changing socioeconomic conditions, both in the United States and in Hawaii. It's a novel that deals with issues of faith and race and class. And it's something that took me about, I think it took me about 10 years to write. So thank you for taking the time to find out about the book with me. This section is from the perspective of one of the main characters named Nainoa, and he is experiencing these unexplainable events. He has abilities that he doesn't quite understand, and he's working as a paramedic. And this is a scene where he and his partner enter a house to treat some apparent uh, victims of a traumatic injury. The light inside was sooty, the wood floor gouged and cross-slashed from years of use, crown molding and naked bulbs. Near a dingy sectional couch was the first patient, skeletal and sallow, 
with an officer bent over his torso, ramming him with chest compressions. Aaron dropped to the floor by the officer's side and he understood, pulling his hands back like it was time to wash them. The second? Aaron asked, even as she started compressions, and the officer nodded toward the kitchen. I went, around the corner, into the stench. It was as if a cat had pissed into a moldering refrigerator. The wall above the stovetop was scorched, something like a war bomb burn. And on the floor, a topology of discarded cookware and trash bags, organic refuse, and in the back corner, near the refrigerator, the third officer was negotiating a grizzled rope of a meth addict onto a stool. The addict was breathing like he'd just surfaced from drowning, but he was breathing through his tangled roots of goat beard, a face pecked with bloody scabs. The fuck is this party, he said. I was confused and turned toward the officer. He looks alive, I said. That's the problem, the officer said, his nose red and swollen. It looked like he'd taken a punch there. He jerked the addict by his shirt scruff into a better seating position. Any other problems? My mortgage, my kids, your questions, the officer said. He looked like he was waiting for me to leave. Maybe check his friend in the living room. But I was already gone as he said that. Back to where we came in, I saw the baseball bat for the first time on the floor, grip tape blackened with palm sweat, the end pink and spiked with bits of hair. There were fist-sized hamburger wrappers balled all over, an empty bookshelf leaning drunk against the back corner, and there was Aaron working on the one who'd been beaten, paddles in her hands. The patient was still on his back, his leg left folded wrong, bent sideways and high. Eyes closed, the blue bloom of his lips. Hey, Inspector, you want to help me here? Aaron said, holding the paddles, and I already had an idea. I dropped to my knees. There was no pulse, not a hint at the carotid or ulnar. Defib isn't working because his heart isn't beating, I said. Now the stink of sweat and urine, there his crusty shirt already yanked up around the splay of his armpits, a dollop of gel at the ribs, another at the pectoral. I lost it, she said, dropping the paddles. It was there. It's gone, I said. I know. Airway clear? Fuck you, she said. I'm not an idiot. It's the bat that did this. Maybe the drugs, I said. Let's try again. I stitched my fingers together, put the edge of my palm into his sternum, and compressed, careful to avoid the xiphoid process and the hemorrhage that could follow its snapping. His body. At the beginning, it was just him, a man, but my eyes and teeth pinched as I compressed his chest, the oxygenated gasp of everything that moved in him, and then I felt as if I were squinting my brain. He was the him I saw, but also a him I felt. I felt the weave of his skin and the buttery chunks of fat underneath, the hush and rush of what could only be his blood, so long and blowing, all of this just a feeling. It was nothing I saw. There were other muddled sensations deeper down, but strongest was an effervescent urge, his body eager to start repairing itself, but even that came and went so thick, I couldn't separate all of this from the that. There were colors I felt. He had the yellow tarry rush of meth's hate booming through his veins, then the jagged red memories of anger that came and went like thunderheads inside his skull, a color I'd felt many times before. And all the while, the truth of in my hands, chest compressions, shoving blood around his husk. I was on my knees and over the patient, my palms at his sternum, dropping my weight down and letting it come back up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, on and on and on. The liquid pop of the already broken ribs went like a clock. Something sparked. It certainly wasn't the compressions. It was only that I was searching, the same as I always am when I do this now, searching and feeling and trying to understand what the injury was at the same time that I understood what his body should be. I think something had already started. Erin was saying my name like a chant. Her fingers hooked into my tight deltoid. I realized she was shaking me. The look I must have given her as I took my hands off the body. It's been five minutes since you started, superhero, she said. No change. We need to transport. I was breathing hard, as she had been, and I could feel the slick, cool sweat patches at my back and chest. But the addict's body was quiet. Everything was finished, wasn't it? The police officers watched us pull back from the body, the still point of sound, when everyone understands. Transport, Aaron said again. She was gone and returned with the gurney, bashing it up the steps with one of the officers, bright metal crashes as it hit each stair. I was still doing compressions until we lifted him into the gurney, then rolled it back down the stairs and into the wide open back of the ambulance. Aaron legged up into the back with the gurney and had started to close one of the ambulance doors when the patient sat up calmly spat Aaron's plastic rescue breath guard from his mouth and said, holy, holy, holy. We froze. Aaron reaching for the still open door, me about to secure the other. We stared across the gap between the end of the rig where we were and the risen body in the back. Even from that distance, I could see the yellow blue flush had left his skin, the wrinkles shallowing, his hair thicker. It was as if he'd been made younger by 50 years. He looked, in a word, healthy. 
He curled his spine forward and hacked a wave of vomit onto the snow-white sheet covering his lap. His mouth was slack. He looked down at the, his mess, then back up at us, wiped his jaw with his wrist. Glanced again at his lap, where the sheet had swelled into a pyramid with a thick knob at the apex. I think I have a boner, he said. What happened? Thank you all for joining the program today. I hope you're enticed to buy all these books and support the authors. Thanks.